This is affirming scripture, a sex-positive view of Christianity. Finding your perfect match. What does modern research say? What does the Bible say? Finding your perfect match. What does modern research say? And what does the Bible say? There is surprising agreement. Finding your perfect match. Today, we focus on three things that modern research and scripture say can make or break relationships and marriages. But first, Recapping last episode, we saw that 90% of Americans have premarital sex and that more than half of all American teens have intercourse by age 18. We also saw that to minimize the risks and maximize the probability of safe outcomes requires three things. Romance, ultra-reliable birth control, and safe sex practices. Especially the consistent use of condoms. That was Graham Claire co-hosting again today. She is writing a book summarizing 70 years of research on sex, and the working title is Sex Essentials, What Parents, Pastors, and Teachers Rarely Tell Young Women. Last episode, we saw that teen moms and their children fare poorly, and we saw that romantic sex rules and hookup sex flunks out. The statistics favor romantic sex and show that hookup intercourse has worse outcomes, particularly for those under age 19. Today, finding your perfect match. What does modern research say? What does the Bible say? Smiles from old pictures. The first item on our list is so simple, I'm almost embarrassed to mention it. Simple, but surprisingly powerful. Let's jump right into the research. Quotes are read by Descript, not the original authors. Scientists at DePaul University reviewed pictures of people when they were younger and compared them to divorce rates. What they found is simply amazing. People who didn't smile or who had weaker smiles had a higher rate of divorce. People with big toothy grins had happier and longer lasting marriages. The study says that people who smiled least were five times more likely to get a divorce when compared to people who smiled the most. That is from the Marriage and Counseling blog, citing the research of Professor Matt Hertenstein. People who smiled more as children had more successful marriages as adults. Yes, and the effect is quite dramatic. The kids who smiled the most had dramatically lower divorce rates. Really? How can this be? I suspect there are multiple reasons for this. Part of the explanation is that the act of smiling releases love hormones into your brain. This is from There's Magic in Your Smile, How Smiling Affects Your Brain by Ronald E. Riggio writing in Psychology Today. Each time you smile, you throw a little feel-good party in your brain. The act of smiling activates neural messaging that benefits your health and happiness. The feel-good neurotransmitters, dopamine, endorphins, and serotonin are all released when a smile flashes across your face as well. This not only relaxes your body, but it can lower your heart rate and blood pressure. That was from There's Magic in Your Smile, How Smiling Affects Your Brain by Ronald E. Riggio. That reminds me of scripture in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 15, verse 30. A cheerful look brings joy to the heart. Smile first, and happiness follows. I had always assumed you smiled because you were happy. But, as scripture and biochemistry say, smile first and happiness follows. A cheerful look brings joy to the heart. 
The message to married couples is smile at your spouse whenever you look at them. It will bless you both. As Professor Hertenstein showed, people who didn't smile or who had weaker smiles had a higher rate of divorce. People with big toothy grins had happier and longer lasting marriages. The message for people dating, smile at people who you're interested in. And keep smiling during the relationship through good times and bad. But it does take discipline if it's not your natural style. If smiling does not come naturally to you, it may feel a bit fraudulent. Smile anyway. Whether a smile happens naturally or takes effort, you get benefits. The act of smiling activates neural messaging that benefits your health and happiness. Let's replay that quote from Ronald E. Riggio again. The act of smiling activates neural messaging that benefits your health and happiness. So pay attention to who smiles at you and smile at people you are interested in knowing better. That's pretty simple. Smile at people you want to develop a deeper relationship with and smile at your partner. But it is not so simple. Many women are told they would be more attractive if they smiled more. That's misogynistic and paternalistic. Yes, it's complex. If you smile more, you will likely attract more people, and some of them may be creepy. And be aware, when you smile at someone or withhold a smile, it likely causes a biochemical reaction in both your brain and theirs. And it can be challenging in work environments and on public transit. Some people, both men and women, have trouble transitioning from their work or public transit personas to their home or dating personas. Replacing their masks of caution or disinterest with a more open and joyful set of facial expressions. Yes, and there are different types of smiles. It is a complex signaling pathway prone to misunderstanding. Nevertheless, I think your advice in this context is sound. Smile at people you want to develop a deeper relationship with and smile at your partner. What is item two on your list of three secrets to finding your perfect, God-honoring match? Avoid evildoers and look for the fruits of the Spirit. If you ask a therapist or a divorce attorney who you should never date, never have sex with, and definitely never marry, they will probably say, People with Antisocial Personality Disorders The DSM-5 defines antisocial personality as someone having three or more of the following traits. 1. Regularly breaks or flouts the law. 2. Constantly lies and deceives others. 3. Is impulsive and doesn't plan ahead. 4. Can be prone to fighting and aggressiveness. 5 has little regard for the safety of others. Six, is irresponsible and can't meet financial obligations. And seven, doesn't feel remorse or guilt. Consistently lies and deceives others, can be prone to fighting and aggressiveness, and doesn't feel remorse or guilt. The Bible calls these people evildoers. The media often calls these individuals psychopaths or sociopaths. Don't date them, don't have sex with them, and don't marry them. Younger members of our audience, that is almost everyone, may not have seen the 1987 hit movie Fatal Attraction. It gives you a chilling sense of the dangers of becoming involved with someone who constantly lies and deceives others, and can be prone to fighting and aggressiveness, and has little regard for the safety of others, and doesn't feel remorse or guilt. Avoid evildoers, sociopaths, and psychopaths. Avoid individuals with antisocial personality disorders. Not good people to become involved with. 
I can never recall my parents, pastors, or any teacher explicitly saying, these people are dangerous to become involved with and will lead to pain and heartbreak for you and any children you have with them. Some people are attracted to the excitement of those who flout the law or have little regard for the safety of others. Don't be. Don't be seduced by the excitement of rule-breaking and dangerous behavior. Instead, look for partners who exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Date people who exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, how do you find someone who exhibits the fruits of the Spirit? Put it in your dating profile? Seeking partner who exhibits fruits of the Spirit. P.S. No psychopaths need respond. Dating profiles are beyond me, even though it is the most common way people meet their marriage partners today. And the marriage stability that comes from online dating is looking good. Let's talk about once you're dating someone or meeting them for a cup of coffee. What questions do you ask to separate the evildoers from individuals who exhibit the fruits of the Spirit? The internet has lots of lists of first date questions. I will include a link to a good list in the notes. But I like, what were you like as a kid? Followed by, how were your experiences in high school? But questions can take you only so far. I tell my granddaughters to stress test guys. Shop together during really crowded times or go to restaurants with really crummy service. And watch whether your date exhibits patience, self-control, and a gentleness in dealing with servers and cashiers? Exactly. Long lines and messed up restaurants are the perfect places to observe the fruits of the Spirit. So bad dating logistics can be better than a perfect date. At least for discovering someone's character. You heard it here first. Botched logistics can expose your date's true character. I also like to watch how a date deals with children, grandparents, and the incompetent. Yes, children, grandparents, and the inept have a way of exposing one's spiritual gifts or lack thereof. I tell my granddaughters before you get engaged, if you have any doubts about your partner's character, volunteer together particularly where you are working with people that are less well-off than you. You see someone's true character when you see them working with the disadvantaged or the downtrodden. Matthew 25, verse 40. Whatever you did for one of my brothers or sisters, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did for me. So our first tip for finding your perfect match Look for someone who smiles a lot. Or at least smiles at you. Or at least smiles at you. And our second tip is, avoid psychopaths and evildoers. Instead, look for someone who exhibits the fruits of the Spirit. Before we go on to our third tip, is there anything we should add? I think modern research says, Paul left one important item from his list of fruits of the Spirit. Whoa, what is that? Gratitude, what the Bible calls thankfulness. Paul talks about thankfulness elsewhere. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. The act of being grateful actually makes one happier. Gratitude, like smiling, causes good hormones to flood the brain. So when you're standing in a long line or dealing with poor service, does your date get angry or are they thankful to have extra time with you? Exactly. 
angry, entitled people make poor partners. And the person who was grateful for the one thing that went right during a burnt dinner. They are happier. The people around them are happier, and they make better partners. The dinner is still burnt. But they are not controlled by their circumstances. Their gratitude becomes their focus. They are thankful to be with you, even when the circumstances are challenging. So, just to recap so far, when looking for your perfect match, look for someone who smiles at you, exhibits the fruits of the Spirit, and gratitude. And avoid people who lie, are aggressive, and have little empathy for others. We will include links to this research and all the research we discussed today in the podcast notes. Moving to the third topic. The Einstein of Love, Dr. John Gottman, a giant in the field of relationship and marriage research. Dr. Gottman is able to predict divorce with better than 90% accuracy. Psychology Today calls him the Einstein of love. He figured out the formula for relationship success. This is a one-minute excerpt from Dr. Gottman summarizing decades of research, observing thousands of American couples, and the amazingly simple formula that predicts relationship success or failure. Let me start by talking about what it is we learned that allows us to predict divorce or stability with very high accuracy. The first thing we found was that if you take a look at the ratio of positive stuff during conflict, things like interest, asking questions, being nice to one another, being kind, being affectionate, being empathetic. Those sound a bit like the fruits of the spirit. Yes, a similar list. Dr. Gottman continues. And you look at all the negative stuff like criticism, hostility, anger, hurt feelings, and you take the ratio of positive to negative. In relationships that stay together, that ratio turns out to be five to one. There's five times as many positive things going on in relationships that work as negative. During difficult conversations, successful couples ask each other questions and are empathetic to their partner's viewpoint. Successful couples say five times as many positive things to each other as negative. What about couples headed for divorce? They say more negative stuff to each other than positive. Just a tiny bit more negativity than positivity can sink a marriage. Only a small percentage of marriages can survive a lot of negative language. And it's not just negative language. Dr. Gottman describes four types of relationship-destroying behavior. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. So negative body language can also sink a marriage. What do you do if you are a Debbie Downer or a Mr. Negativity? Dr. Gottman suggests. If you do something negative to hurt your partner's feelings, you know, that you have to make up for it with five positive things. So the equation is not balanced in terms of positive and negative. Negative has a lot more ability to inflict pain and damage. What if you have already had a child with Mr. Negativity or Debbie Downer? What do you do if you have already had a child with Mr. Negativity or Debbie Down. Well, do something, because the odds do not favor a happy end for you or your children. Just this morning, I received an email about the new Gottman Relationship Advisor. You fill out an online assessment with your partner or by yourself, and it builds a customized program of videos and exercises for you. Prices are very reasonable. The Gottman Institute has also done research into same-sex relationships and has a newsletter and blog for those who are single. You heard it here first. 
Sign up for Dr. Gottman's Singles Newsletter and get dating advice from the Einstein of love. I will put links in the notes. Let's talk about the scripture that mirrors this research. There is considerable scripture on taming one's tongue. Probably the most famous is in the third chapter of James. But I think the most useful in this context is Ephesians 4.29. Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed, so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. There has probably never been better marriage advice than Ephesians 4.29. Let's listen to it again in a different translation. Don't say anything that would hurt another person. Instead, speak only what is good, so that you can give help wherever it is needed. That way, what you say will help those who hear you. As a child, I hated it when my mother told me, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything. It turns out, this is excellent marriage advice. If you can't say something nice to your spouse, just don't say anything. Dr. Gottman suggests, if you do something negative to hurt your partner's feelings, you know, that you have to make up for it with five positive things. So for every time you ignore, belittle, or put down your partner or date, you have to say five positive things. Say or do. So signs of affection, like smiling, count. Yes. And Dr. Gottman is talking specifically about when couples discuss areas of disagreement. In my marriage, the most frequent areas of disagreement were about spending money or if we should have sex. Child care and household chores, long work hours and in-laws are also points of disagreement in many relationships. Are there real couples that can discuss these topics and say five times as many positive things as negative. Keeping a marriage together long-term is tough. So in dating, pay attention to how you discuss difficult issues. When dating, avoid trash talkers. To misquote 1 Peter, the one who desires a stable marriage, to love and see good days, must avoid dating those whose tongues do evil and lips speak harmfully. What is the actual scripture? The one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. Your version focuses on not dating individuals who speak harmfully or deceitfully. But the actual scripture says that you yourself must not speak harmfully or deceitfully. This reminds us that both partners in a successful relationship must avoid harmful language and deceit. Let's listen to your version, the dating version, and then the actual scripture one more time. The one who desires a stable marriage, to love and see good days, must avoid dating those whose tongues do evil and lips speak harmfully. And here is the original. The one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. We have focused so far on avoiding negativity. Because it takes five positive remarks or actions to make up for just one negative. But let's spend just a minute and listen again to what Dr. Gottman said about the positive side of the equation. Positive stuff during conflict, things like interest, asking questions, being nice to one another, being kind, being affectionate, being empathetic. So if you want to be successful at relationships and marriage, remember what the Einstein of love said. Express interest, ask questions, be kind, be affectionate, and be empathetic. That's also true for parenting. Express interest, ask questions, be kind, be affectionate, and be empathetic. 
Echoes of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. I had hoped that was only for people who agreed with me. No, I'm pretty sure that Paul meant for couples to encourage one another and build each other up when they were arguing about whose family to spend Christmas with. There might even be a lost letter from Paul that says, Therefore, in marriage, avoid harmful words. Instead, you should encourage one another and build each other up. Before we wrap up, let's listen to the clip we heard from Dr. Gottman one more time uninterrupted. Let me start by talking about what it is we learned that allows us to predict divorce or stability with very high accuracy. The first thing we found was that if you take a look at the ratio of positive stuff during conflict, things like interest, asking questions, being nice to one another, being kind, being affectionate, being empathetic, and you look at all the negative stuff like criticism, hostility, anger, hurt feelings, and you take the ratio of positive to negative, in relationships that stay together, that ratio turns out to be five to one. There's five times as many positive things going on in relationships that work as negative. Is it just me? I feel like there's a certain similarity between Paul's fruits of the Spirit and the actions that Dr. Gottman says are required in a successful marriage. Let's listen to the two lists. They were written almost 2,000 years apart. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And what Dr. Gottman said, interest, asking questions, being nice to one another, being kind, being affectionate, being empathetic. To summarize what we have discussed today. One, when looking for a partner, look for someone who smiles at you. Whose face lights up when they look at you. Two, look for someone who exhibits the fruits of the Spirit and gratitude. While avoiding those who lie, cheat, are aggressive, or have little regard for the safety of others. And three, look for someone that you can discuss difficult issues with while passing the Gottman test, saying or doing at least five positive things for every negative remark or gesture. These are all a reflection of the fruit of the Spirit, having both the grace and the discipline to discuss difficult issues without attacking blaming, or shaming. And we cannot forget romance. Yes, we cannot forget romance, which we discussed in the last episode along with how to prevent accidental pregnancies and being disciplined when it comes to issues of sexual safety. In closing, I hope you have enjoyed this two-episode detour. It all started with a question from a young man during the coffee hour after church. What does God honoring gay sex look like? To which I answered, God honoring gay sex is very similar to God honoring straight sex. I received a blank stare of incomprehension, and I felt called to address this issue. Last episode, we focused on President Carter's call not to harm anyone. This is a major theme in both the Old and New Testaments. In a world where more than half of all teens and over 90% of adults have sex outside of marriage, and where the typical American young woman does not marry until she is almost 30. Last episode, we saw that God honoring sex requires using ultra-reliable birth control and condoms, and avoiding hookup intercourse. Today, we saw that people who reflect the fruits of the Spirit on their faces, in their words, and in their body language, make better 
relationship, and marriage partners. Next episode, the prophet Isaiah's great blessing to sexual minorities. This has been Elton Sherwin and Grandma Claire. A lot more coming up. Thank you for listening.